So I wanted to talk about Rosh Hashanah, pretty topical thing to be talking about. But in particular, I'll tell you why I think it's really um, good to explore. First of all, so much of what happens in the year is determined by what happens on Rosh Hashanah. But also because it's one of the hardest days to actually figure out. In every single Jewish day, the primary emotion that we're meant to feel is almost always very obvious. On Sukkot, it's, it's obvious. We're meant to be in a time of joy. Pesach, Shavuos, Shavuot. You have to excuse my, excuse my Ashkenazi pronunciation. But um, we know that on Tisha B'Av, we're in a place of sadness. It's usually pretty straightforward. There might be other auxiliary emotions, but the core central place that we're meant to try to be or get to is usually incredibly clear. On Rosh Hashanah, it's not. And that's to be found all over. In Halacha, you see, uh, in the Shulchan Aruch, there's an entire simon in Shulchan Aruch, in um, Tovkov Tzadi Zayin, where there's an actual debate on Rosh Hashanah. Are we meant to be having festive meals or are we meant to be fasting? Now, you never normally get that level of extreme. Everybody agrees you should eat some point in the 24 hours, but is it better to fast during the day? Is it better to have the meal during the day? And that's literally, where are we? And that's true all over Halakha, but it's not just true in the halachic sources, it's true also hashkafically, as we'll discuss philosophically, and it's even true in the only Rosh Hashanah that we have described to us in Tanakh. Normally, if you only read the Torah, you wouldn't really know what happens on Rosh Hashanah. You would know that on the first day of the seventh month, you bring some special offerings, and it's a day of blowing, presumably, shofar. Right? That's really all we know. We don't know judgment taking place. We don't know what else you're meant to do at that particular point. The only real description of an actual Rosh Hashanah is in the book of Nehemiah, in the eighth chapter, when they've come back and there's a Torah being read to them in the temple, in the, in the grounds of the Beis HaMikdash. It's on uh, Rosh Hashanah. And then Nehemiah and all the leaders get up and tell the people to stop crying. They were all crying. And lechu go echlu mashmanim, eat good fat food. We today like fat wool, you know. In those days, as opposed to a scrawny, non-existent chicken, you actually have one with a bit of meat on it, you know. That was called a joyful thing. Shesum takim, drink nice sweet drinks. And give mishlach manas, give gifts, food gifts, one to another. Why? Uh, explain, the, explain all the others, because ki chad Hashem, hi the celebration you have with God, that is your strength. Now that last line is interesting. They're not saying, you're wrong guys, you shouldn't be crying. Don't worry, you're hearing the Torah and you might not have been keeping it well. Don't cry, it's a happy day. No, no, no. There is a plausible justification for your tears, but there is an override. The rejoicing you have with God and God has with you overrides the state of tears. In other words, there is, it's not meant as a pun, but a two-tier Rosh Hashanah, two levels. There is a level at which we experience tears and fear, and there is an override level at which we experience joy, but they're both there. One is in the background, one is in the foreground, but we experience both. And of course, if you look around the Shul on Rosh Hashanah, you'll see all sorts of emotions and all sorts of things going on. More than that, there's an amazing Madrash. I don't think we have the source Madrash nowadays, but the Torah brings it in Tafko Pe'alaf. It's very famous. And it says that when most people go into judgment, traditionally centuries ago, they would turn up if it was a capital case where they might lose their life, they would typically walk into the room disheveled. They hadn't had time to worry about laundry, laundering their clothes. They, they would come in looking unshaven, unwashed, clothing, unclean. Nowadays, with that's ridiculous. Turn up in court looking your best. But in old times, people literally lived in trepidation. They didn't have time to think about luxuries like laundry. And these things weren't two-minute jobs either. Not the laundry is a two-minute job, actually. But <laughs> none of this stuff was, was that quick. And people would come in looking, looking shaken, looking like the fear of death has gripped them. Loichein Yisrael, the Torah quotes the Medrash, not Israel. They come in levenim in... in, in well, some translate it as white clothes, which is part of the customs of white. Other means laundered clothes. They come shaven or, 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 or haircut and looking neat. 
They come. Why? How comes? We're in a, a, a capital case, right? There's life or death. It's very serious and very heavy. Betuchim, says this Torah quoting the Medrash, strangely enough, confident that a miracle will occur. Not necessarily individually, but collectively, the miracle will occur and will be sealed for life. And that raises many questions. Question number one is there is a principle that ain't you're never allowed to rely on a miracle. If we're relying on, if it's a miracle, we can't be confident in it by definition. A miracle has to be a specific decision by God to override the natural order of things. If you need a miracle, it means in the natural order, you're not going to make it. How can you be confident of a miracle then? And if it's definitely going to happen, you can be confident. Then it's not a miracle. It's another law. Every law on some level is a miracle. If God's built a law into the world that you'll make it through Rosh Hashanah, then that's not a miracle, that's a law. So which is it? But there's another interesting point. Every time we're in a situation of facing national death and it moves into life, we say halal. And the Marashal asks it slightly differently. He says, why don't we then come in pure festive clothing? In those days on Yom and Tov, on festivals, you wore colored clothing. Why don't we wear the full-blown festive clothing? Oh no, says the Marashal. Same answer the Shulchan Aruch gives about why we don't say halal. And the Gemara really. Could it be that the books of life and death are open in front of you and you're coming in in colored clothes, you're saying halal? One sec. In other words, this is a serious day. There's a real judgment going on over here. You can just walk around in colored clothes. Oh, but don't worry. Don't take it too seriously because a miracle is going to happen. So which is it? It's like some strange knife edge. You're, is it make believe? Is it for real? It is happening. It isn't happening. There is a judgment. It is serious. It's not. It's yes. It's no. Where are we? And here I want to begin the exploration. And hopefully we'll uncover at least some of the layers of Rosh Hashanah and hopefully be able to elevate ourselves, please God, the whole world, through our Rosh Hashanah. And it begins with the following. Yom Hadin. We call it the day of judgment. There's a lot of judgment points in the year. If we follow the classical rabbinic sources, the Mishnah, there are every single festival, every Yom Tov is a day of judgment because the decision has not yet been made as to what will emerge. At Pesach, we're just beginning the new harvest. How much will grow? It's being judged. On Sukkot, how much rain's going to fall? It's being judged. On Shavuos, how the fruit's going to come through the summer? That's being judged. To some degree, every day of the year, there's some micro-judgment taking place. But on Rosh Hashanah, says the Mishnah, Kol Boya Olam, over in the front of the whole of humanity is being viewed by God. We may be the ones who are praying. By the way, it's interesting that on Rosh Hashanah, even though normally our communal prayer, we become, we leave our personal world and we enter the Jewish collective and we pray for Yisrael, for Israel, we become mouthpieces. On Rosh Hashanah, we do more than that. We become collective mouthpieces for the whole of humanity. We daven to Hashem for the state of the world. The whole world should come together as one. To fulfill your will. Everyone who's alive, everything that breathes should say Hashem. We're literally davening for the whole world. Rosh Hashanah, the whole world's being looked at. And here's the interesting thing. What stands in the dock on Rosh Hashanah is existence itself. You see, whenever there's a court case, the question being asked, somebody is being asked to justify something. If someone's accusing us of theft, we're being just asked to justify our possession of a good or money or whatever it may be. If somebody's being accused of a crime, they might be asked to justify why they should still have freedom and not be sent to jail. Some think there's a question of what justifies what. On Rosh Hashanah, the question is what justifies our very existence. The premise being that our next year doesn't yet exist. And here's the thing. If a person's standing in a dock in a capital case against another human being, there's a lot of things we think about asserting. Judge, I'm a good person. If I've done wrong, I'm planning to change. I'd like to be a better person. I've... But when we're standing face to face, with our very creator, 
None of this seems to work. Hashem, give me another year because I've been a good person. And God says, oh, do I need you to be a good person? No, no, but, but I'm going to be a better person. Do I need you to be a better person? But, but I've got a right to life. It says so in the American Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and God says, I I'm thinking you into existence right now. I'm asking you why I shouldn't think about a different world, for example. Just switch off this one, start the next one. What are you going to tell me? And here's the powerful point. The point is that we're going to get to the moment when we realize that we have no answer to that question. There is no good, compelling argument we could give that would compel God to continue to create us. This is, by the way, the, a part of the reason why we do no explicit teshuva on Rosh Hashanah. We don't say, I'm sorry for this, I've done wrong, I'm sorry for that. It doesn't make a difference. Rosh Hashanah is getting to the core of existence and we're meant to get to the place of such deep existential dread as we recognize we, no matter how great we've been, no matter how great we're planning to be, we have no right, no claim to existence. In the piyot, the, most, the very popular piyot on Hosanna Toikev, I think all Ashkenazi communities say, I did all Sfad, I don't know all Sfad, I don't know, I don't know. But, in Hosanna Sanatoikev, we say, Umalochim yechafezun v'chil ura'odo yechafezun. The angels are trembling. They're gripped with dread. V'yoyimu hine yoyimadin. Here's the day of judgment. What's an angel done wrong? Nothing. It's only, it is an algorithm that plays out the will of God. It can't do things wrong. Or it just becomes extinct. That's not, it's not about right or wrong. It's the sense that I, I am a figment of God's imagination. He has no reason to think of me into existence. And if a person or being were real with that, it would shake them to their core. There are even sources that claim that Sarah Imenu, our mother Sarah, died on Rosh Hashanah because she came to that realization. Through the Akedah, through the fact that God could say he could take away Yitzhak, and she sees an image. By the way, amazingly enough, when we are in school, we all learnt that Sarah, we all, I don't know who learnt what, I'm sorry, I shouldn't assume any background, but the standard story, one of the versions of the Medrash is that the Satan, there's a satanic image, comes to Sarah and he deceives her and shows her Avram's about to offer their, their child they've longed for their whole life for, Yitzhak, and she dies there and then from the shock of the moment. But there is another version of the Medrash that says she saw the end of the story and she still died from the shock. And there is a third version that Yitzhak himself came home and said, Mommy, you'd never guess what nearly happened to me today. And as he tells the story, she leaves the world. Rav Hutna says the deep meaning is she became so clear that we have no right to existence. She was so real with it that she actually lost her existence. There's a moment that we go through on Rosh Hashanah like that. So what do we say? What is our answer? And the answer is only one answer. There's only one thing we can say. And this is actually the theme of everything we do on Rosh Hashanah. We say, God, give us existence. Not because we want it. Or because we demand it. But because you want it and you demand it. This is literally the words that Gaonim added into davening, right at the beginning of the Amidah for the whole 10 days of Teshuvah. Chosveinu b'seif arachayim, right? Zechreinu l'chayim, remember us for life. Melech, the king who is? Chofetz b'chayim, you desire life. Chosveinu b'seif arachayim, write us in the book of life. Leman chof, for your sake. Elokim chayim, not for our sake. This is so profound. It's so easy just to read those words and think, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. That is radical. This is a powerful claim. God, you're asking me why I should live. I don't have an answer, but you want me to live. And I want to be a part of your plan. It's a shift out of any semblance of self and self-centered thinking and a complete rupture of that, a shattering of that, and a rebuilding in its place, a literal God-centered thinking, where I, yes, the world is 
a figment of your imagination, God, but your imagination is the greatest thing ever. And I want to fulfill your imagination. I want to fulfill your dream. If this world is your dream, my dream is your dream. My life is yours. I want to fulfill it. You know, there's a remarkable, again, very famous picture. The Rambam presents it one way. Children often view it as scales being weighed. Right? The Rambam discusses where, he didn't use the word scales, but he discusses in the third chapter of the laws of Teshuvah that there's a weighing that takes place. It takes place when a person leaves this world and it takes place every year on Rosh Hashanah. What is weighed? So in our picture that we typically form, there's like loads of mitzvahs, all the good deeds a person does on one side of the scale, there's all the negative stuff on the other side, and like, you know, there's a kind of a count. How many do we have on each side? Until it can, and then that the, goes like this. Those who tilt one way, if you're just a slight majority good, Rosh Hashanah, written to life. Those who goes the wrong way, slight bit, written to death. Bain and in, those who are in between, who are 50 50, Tuluyim, they're waiting to see if they do Tshuva to Liam Kippur. Very strange. It's based on a Gemara in Rosh Hashanah. Very strange for many, many reasons. First of all, as all the more or less every commentary on the Gemara, certainly the majority, right? But it's not how the world works. We don't see evil people dropping dead every Rosh Hashanah, and we see plenty of good people who don't make it through a given year. So that's clearly something's missing there. But more, more importantly, just within its own structure, there's a logical problem. What is the statistical probability that somebody's got an equal amount of mitzvahs and averas? Every roughly three seconds, there's six constant mitzvahs at every moment of life, right? The, the, the list at the beginning of many halachos safarim, emun and Hashem, nothing but Hashem, unifying Hashem, loving Hashem, fearing Hashem, loisasur, not getting distracted. That's every second. Out of the number of three second periods in the year, and just try to come up with a statistical probability that anybody has ever had an equal number, and it's zero. I mean, to the nearest percent or nearest thousand. It's just not going to happen. So that means Yom Kippur is irrelevant. Everybody has been decided on Rosh Hashanah, and of course that's not what's going on. And if one listens carefully to the Rambam, the Rambam never says we weigh mitzvahs against Averis, positive acts against negative acts. If we would, we know from many other sources throughout all of, uh, pretty much unanimous in Jewish sources, every single good act gets a reward, every single negative gets punished. You can be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu, no question he every year positive outweighed the negative, and yet, he does one thing wrong. He can be severely punished. You could be as evil as Izabal and or Achov, and they do one thing right, and they get rewarded. Everything gets rewarded. Everything gets punished. What's going on? And the answer is, the way of Rosh Hashanah is not asking the question, what have you done? The Rambam doesn't say mitzvahs against the Averis, positive acts against negative. He says zechuyos against avonus. What does the word zechus mean? Merit. A merit. It's not something you do. It's related to the word zako, something that's pure. It's a level of purification, right? What is an oven? It can be an act, but it can also mean a corruption. We're not weighing what you've done, says the Rambam. We're weighing who you've become as a result of what you've done. You can have a person who, and at Rosh Hashanah, we can tilt at that moment. Who are we? That's the question of Rosh Hashanah. Who are we and what are we living for? What about, what about all that we've done in the year? We'll worry about that. That's coming. That's Yom Kippur. But Rosh Hashanah is asking us something so profound and so powerful. It's who are we at the core of our being. And we could be a person who's done very little good or fallen very short of our ideal standards or nowhere near where the Torah would love us to be. But in our heart, in our essence, we really, really, really want to be good. We really want to be good for the world. We want to be a conduit for blessing. We want purity. We want giving. We want to be there for others. We want that. That's who we are. Then on Rosh Hashanah, we're written into the Book of Life. What is the Book of Life, just by the way? It doesn't necessarily mean physical life, although that's a part of it. The Rambam in the later chapter, the Laws of Teshuvah, teaches us. It's the Book of Significance. History is being co-authored by God and man what role we're going to be given this year. Opportunities, we might be given interactions with people where the consequence of us dealing positively will ripple across history and change the world forever. That's called being written into the book of life. 
others can be written into the book of non-life even whilst they physically walk planet Earth. Nothing significant will come of them this year, even if they do their best. So the book that we're being written to is how significant will our life be? That's determined on Rosh Hashanah primarily by where we are in our inner being. And there, we try to be God-centered, right? Some people come out completely self-centered. Many people, maybe most people, come out undecided and now need the work of the next seven days. But Rosh Hashanah is there to force us to dig deep within ourselves and draw out resources, find the voice within us that really, really wants, because every single one of us has that voice. I want to do your will, creator of the universe. I want to harmonize my existence with what's good for the world and creation. And I have a contradictory set of voices. I am a human being. I am, I think, more than 99% genetically the same as a chimpanzee, right? So, okay, I got a bit of that stuff too. I'm torn. I don't do everything right. But in my depth of being, you ask me why I want to live, Laman Khalakim Chayim, for your sake. Here's the deep and beautiful point. On Rosh Hashanah, God has absolute faith in us. You know, we always speak about, in Judaism, we have faith in God. But actually what we speak about is we have unshakable faith in God who has unshakable faith in us. It's a line we say every morning. Thank you for life. You've given me back my soul. Bechemla with love. Rabbi Emunah how great is your faith? Not how great is our faith, how great is your faith? It's an amazing thing. Every year on Rosh Hashanah, we step out of ordinary existence. And I do want to have time for questions if we'll get there. Every single Jewish calendar date commemorates something. Every Jewish calendar date relives the energy that was there on the day it happened or the day that we read about it. Pesach, we don't just commemorate in the past coming out of Egypt, but to some extent we're obligated to re-experience it in some level every generation. Every generation when a see ourselves coming out of Egypt. The Rambam adds the word Achshov right now. Right now. We're reliving it. Sukkot, we relive the first night when they came to the place called Sukkot, full of Sukkot, and then the clouds of glory took over. We relive that incredible first week of the journey. Okay, it's detached from Pesach, but that Shavuos, we relive what it means to be in contact with the creator of the universe, receiving his will. On Tisha B'Av, we relive what it means to have a base that's destroyed and the rupture between heaven and earth and all the tragedies that unfold as a result. What do we relive on Rosh Hashanah? What event, you see, every single calendar date apart from Rosh Hashanah actually relives something in the first two years of, of, of the nation. Pesach became free in Egypt. Shavuos received the Torah. Shiva Asa Batamos, the 17th of Tammuz. The original one was when the golden calf was served. Tisha B'Av, the original one, was actually a year later when the spies came back. Yom Kippur was when we got forgiven and we got the second tablet. Sukkot, the day that we began the process of gathering everything to build the Mishkan, to build God's tabernacle. Hanukkah, according to the Medrash, they'd finished. They kept everything in storage. The, the year tracks the original with one exception. Nothing happened on Rosh Hashanah. Nothing in our journey out of Egypt happened on Rosh Hashanah. Nothing happened in our formative year on Rosh Hashanah. Because Rosh Hashanah, the very first Rosh Hashanah, was not on the first year of Israel, of the Jewish people. It's the days of creation itself. The days of creation, the sixth day of creation is Rosh Hashanah. Which means that just like when we at Pesach, we relive the moment of coming out of Egypt, on Rosh Hashanah we relive the day in the Garden of Eden, or actually according to most Midrashim, two days in the Garden of Eden. Well, we have two days Rosh Hashanah. And in the Garden of Eden, man stood as one single soul before God, divided into two, male and female, whose job was to come back together and come to God. And in the Garden of Eden, there was one choice. Do you eat from the tree of life or do you eat from the tree 
of self-centered existence. The Rambam says a tree of knowing good and bad means a tree of no longer connecting to the world through what's real and illusory, but connecting to the world through our subjective sense of how it feels to us. Good and bad should not be the words to describe ethics. They're words that belong in aesthetics. How so? Because think about it. When I say the act is good, I can also say the music is good. The food is good. In fact, the entire vocabulary of <coughs> ethics in any modern language, I'm guessing that by the way, certainly in English, is borrowed entirely from aesthetics. How things look, sound, smell, feel, taste. So we could say the music or the food is good. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's amazing. And we can describe a sacrificial, somebody's sacrifice for the good of others. What a good thing, what a beautiful, what a wonderful or amazing thing. Someone gives loads of charity, volunteers. It's the same vocabulary. Conversely, if we have a negative aesthetic sensation, we use words like it's bad, it's disgusting, it's horrible, it's revolting. And if we hear about a mass murder, rape, or it's bad, it's disgusting, it's horrible, it's revolting, it's the same word. Why? Because the vocabulary of aesthetics is not describing the way the world is, it's describing how it makes us feel. When I see that scene, it gives me a wonderful sensation. I shortcut that by saying, it is wonderful. If it makes me feel wonderful, it's wonderful. If it makes me feel revolted, it's revolting. We hope that our ethical intuitions are roughly aligned with something that's real in the world. But in the end, when we say someone does something good or wonderful, we mean something that triggers a good or wonderful feeling in us when we think about it. When we say someone did something horrific and disgusting, we mean it triggers something horrifying or disgusted within us. Here's the problem. That's exactly, by the way, what the snake was offering man, according to the Rambam. The snake says in the Garden of Eden, and just by the way, here's the, here's the line I didn't say before. But do you know what Eden means in Hebrew? In Torah Hebrew. In Tanakh it has two meanings. Its secondary meaning is pleasure, idun. But its primary meaning is time. The word zaman does not appear in Torah. It appears in Kohelas and later books of Nach, but not in Torah. Instead, we have ayin, dalad, nun words. They are, right, when Avram is still standing before God, it's, uh, we want to use a temporal word, odenu omid nifnei Hashem. Also in Kairos, those not yet born, edan lo haya. Even in modern Hebrew, adayin, odenu, these are all time words. It's the garden of time. And a garden of time means this. Just like in every culture, every garden is a place you gather something. A zoological garden, you gather animals. In a botanical garden, you gather plants. In a garden of time, it means it's not somewhere you could go to inside space and time. It's all of reality from a different dimension. But it means that the journey and the struggle in the Garden of Eden is one that touches all of time. The single soul of mankind in the garden is expressed in all of us at every moment. And says the Rambam, what the serpent offers man in the garden is the Yisam Kelekim, you can be God, the Das Tovara, knowing good and bad. You can create your own universe. This is how it will look. When somebody makes you feel good, they will be good to you. When somebody makes you feel bad, they will be bad. He says, your eyes will be open. You'll see reality through your eyes. Look how amazing it will be. And isn't that so true? Isn't it so incredibly true when we love somebody and they make us feel good, they can't do anything wrong. They shouted at somebody, our brain whirs in their defense and goes, yes, that person deserved it. They did them a favor. What about when we don't like somebody? Or even when somebody just makes us feel not good. It could be somebody in a relationship we're having a really tough time with. It could be somebody at work who's annoying us. It could be somebody who if we're deeply honest, we might even be jealous of, but watch, the, they make us feel bad. Watch what our brain does. It prosecutes them. Because they make me feel bad, they are evil. And they can do no good. And once our brain has decided somebody's bad, 
Everything they do becomes bad. They gave money to charity. Zzz, our prosecution lawyer springs into action. They're just trying to look good. <laughs> they were nice to somebody. Zzz, they're just sucking up to them. Right? Mm -hmm. Everything is bad. And that's how it works. Of course, that's how arguments work. We always measure what the other person's doing to us in an argument by how much it hurts. If it hurts a lot, they are evil. We measure what we do to them, not by how much it hurts them, how maliciously it was intended. And we were just defending ourselves. So you can have two sides of an argument where each one is convinced they are the victim of the other. That can be true in families, that can be true in communities, that can be true on a global scale. It's true everywhere. It's the sin of the Garden of Eden. Making ourselves into God and becoming the center of reality. It says, brought the shame that Rizal, at that moment Adam chose to become God the center of reality. He could no longer be one. And instead he shatters into billions of pieces. This is not the same as the Shavir HaSakalim, but it's a lower echo. Is thrown out of the Garden of Time and now little fragments of Adam walk planet Earth. You and I and everybody else are one of them. And our job is to rebuild the world, sometimes one relationship at a time. Our job necessitates learning to see the world through eyes of other people. And our job involves learning to see the world as best we can through the eyes of God, as it were. And this is why we can say things like, love your neighbor like yourself, is Klal God of Torah, the great rule of Torah. Where is it the great rule of Torah? Where are the hundred mitzvahs of the Beis HaMikdosh, the temple got to do with it? Where is the laws of Shabbat and kosher got to do? The answer is, of course. Loving your neighbor like yourself means seeing the world as one. And within that is everything. Coming together as humanity and coming to God. On Rosh Hashanah, God invites us back into the Garden of Eden, back into the moment of the creation of man, and the moment mankind had, the say, had a choice. Are you living for me, says God, for reality, for, as one, or are you living for self-centeredness? In which case, no matter how good your life is, if it's premised on self-centeredness, you'll be causing harm, whether you like it or not. And God called out to man that day and said, Ayeko, where are you? And God calls out on Rosh Hashanah with the sound of a shofar that says, where are you? And man answered God that day and said, I'm hiding. I'm afraid, so I'm hiding. And every year Rosh Hashanah, we get the opportunity to say, I am here. I'm afraid, but I'm standing before you. I trust in you, God. And I want to do my part to rebuilding your world. Our prayers on Rosh Hashanah are not prayers about our own agenda. We don't ask for health. We don't ask for wealth. We don't ask, we can bless people with that before Rosh Hashanah and after Rosh Hashanah. Okay, there's a debate amongst modern Muslims, and Hasidas and Islam. Can you also, but in pure, if we were at the right level, we wouldn't even ask for anything personal at all on Rosh Hashanah. We go far deeper. We mamlich Hashem. We spend our prayers saying, God, you're my king. What does that mean? It means I I want to live my life consonant with the flow of your vision. We pray the whole world comes back together as one and comes in harmony to you, God. And we ask God in doing so. We don't even ask him. But we say to him, this is the life I want to lead. And you know the most powerful thing of all, and with this maybe I'll, I'll, I'll finish and try to answer the questions we started with. Imagine a scene where for some bizarre reason you get an email that you're sure is a fake at the beginning and you're ready to delete it. And it has CC'd all the you know, very famous people in the world, political leaders, great people in any area you consider great, great wealthy people. And of course it can't be real. It says, we have been tracking the people we think have the most potential to do great things in the world. And you're like, yeah, 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 sure. And we've come up with you. Okay, we're meant to click and you know. <laughs> and then there's a bunch of criteria. And you think, well, I'll be about to delete that email. You delete it, I'm not gonna read any further. Then you get on your news channel, there's been this crazy thing, there's been a secret set of meetings where they wanna find the people most capable of doing great things in the world. You know, oh, that's funny. I, I read about 
And here's the criteria they're using, having brought sociologists and researchers, not the usual criteria, and you're like, that, oh, what, oh, I really fit those criteria. Let me quickly undelete that material. Oh, it saved him, I deleted items, fine. And you've been invited to come in 30 days time with a presentation to a board with a chance that they're gonna invest hundreds of millions of dollars through you. Now that's a pretty awesome thought. First thought starts to be hundreds of millions of dollars. What were the, uh, yachts and islands and great holidays and all that. And then you realize, well, if I come with that proposal, no one's gonna invest that in me. They want me to improve the world. So I start thinking, well, what are the biggest problems in the world? So I might think of the sort of standard problems, or I might think, one second, where am I positioned in the world? Maybe I want to end poverty globally. Maybe I want to build the Jewish people to what God wants to do. Who knows? What, whatever it is I think is the most important thing in the world or, or the most important thing I'm passionate about and can contribute towards and can develop a plan that if you invest in me, I will do great things to the world. Now, there might be a side benefit that, you know, to get around the world, I might need a, a private helicopter and it would help to have some good holidays here and there, but that'll be a little bit in the small print at the bottom. Fundamentally, at the end of those 30 days, whether I get that investment or not, I will be changed forever. So Rosh Hashanah Hashem calls us back and says, I'm taking you to a secret place, out of the ordinary flow of creation, back into the garden of time, out of time into the garden of time, the room of creation itself. Celebrate with me. Feel that joy. I'm feeling that close to God. There is awe. There's trepidation. There's, I'm a figment of your imagination. I barely feel my own existence. And God's saying, no, 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 but I believe in you. I've created this world because I want a partner. I want humanity as my partner. I want you Jewish people in the role I've given you. And I want you each individual in the role I've assigned for you. You may not think you have significance, but I do. I have a dream for you. I have a will for you. I have a plan for you. Are you willing to live this year according to it? And it's a deep, scary question, but it's a beautiful question. And the shofar awakens it within us. It just does it by itself. You can hear all the debris Torah on the shofar, but it does it. Some, it touches something so deep inside us that it's innocent, that's pure, that's real, and that we almost remember and recognize, yes, I, I really do want to be a part of this. And then we might hear a cynical voice, just cynical voice, stay quiet for today. God, yes, give me life for your sake. And we discover the beauty of who we are. We don't need to worry at that moment about all that we're not. We don't need to feel shame of all that we failed. We don't let, throw that out, that's not where God has us. Listen to the beautiful depth of being and celebrate it for this day. Can we hang on to it for after Rosh Hashanah? That will work on between now and Yom Kippur. Can we get rid of all the stuff that we've done in the past? That will work out between now and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah is not about the detailed plan for the year ahead. That we work out between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The work we do before Rosh Hashanah is to dig deep into what we think our mission is and what our vision for ourselves. not the day after Rosh Hashanah, but one year later. Who would I love to be in a year's time? And on Rosh Hashanah, we work to tap within ourselves to rediscover the depth of our own being. And so the Torah says, we stand down Rosh Hashanah and we don't walk into judgment dressed like we're about to lose everything because we know the miracle will occur. Yes, it is a miracle. Existence is a miracle. We don't have a right to existence. But we know that God wants the miracle. It is a miracle. And we have to feel that it's a miracle. We have to get like the people in Nehemiah, we have to get to the point where we feel the tears of fear, of dread, of, of I don't I have a right to existence. And we shatter the self in that moment. And in its place, we discover the beauty of the depth of being, of what it means to be a component of Adam in the Garden of Eden, what it means to be a thought of the creator of the universe, what it means to be desired, loved, and willed by God himself. It says Nehemiah, yes, your tears now, now stop crying. Now go and celebrate. Now go and share food with one another. <laughs> your love of God, God's love of you. That's your strength. That's what you're tapping into. As you break through the superficial, you arrive at something so beautiful and deep. It's like we've missed it for the year. 
Can we hang on to it? Can we nurture it? Can we nu nourish, be nourished by it for two days? And can we immediately take it out and make a plan through the days of, up to the Yom Kippur? And Hashem shall help all of us. I said I'll stick around for qu have questions. I don't know if I'm gonna have questions in the group because I, I did promise I'll be finished by 9.30, I apologize, but I will stick around if people have questions. In the meantime, I hope this has given some depth of insight. Thank you. But I also want to give everyone a bracha, and we can all give each other a bracha, that we should be able to use these days leading up to Rosh Hashanah. And then when Rosh Hashanah comes, we should be so ready to just awaken the beautiful depth of being. And which should power us for a year ahead, and it should be for us, for our families, for our communities, for the whole Klal for the whole world and for all of Hashem's vision for the world. The year of Bracha, year of Shalom, year of all the beautiful blessings in the world of Shalom.